give it up for Kojo Bafu. Uh, good morning. How's everybody doing? On a Saturday morning, all the way in Pretoria. Um, so I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk um, a bit around content and storytelling. Uh, I have a, I don't know whether it's a healthy or unhealthy relationship with, with just knowledge and information. And I'm one of those people who, who kind of loves knowledge for knowledge's sake. And, and I just find that we're living in a very interesting time when it comes to how we deal with content, how we deal with stories, how we deal with information. But as human beings, we've had a fashion and fascination with telling someone about something for a while. So, you know, whether it's caves, walls, papyrus, we've always been, you know, telling, telling those stories and finding a way to communicate with other people and using the different mediums. Um, whether it's print. So if you look at print, um, you know, from a Western perspective, everybody kind of knows of the Gutenberg, Gutenberg Press and the, the Gutenberg Bible. Um, although, like most things in the world, I've discovered the Chinese kind of did, did all of that probably a couple of hundred years before that. Um, I was fortunate enough to recently visit China. It's just fascinating how, from coins to paper money to you know anything you can think about, they started it probably a thousand years before the rest of us did. To radio in the late 1800s, when you know kind of radio started and there was this journey, and it was constantly about the platform, you know, the platform that we that we use to communicate. Um, I have a lot of slides, but I promise I'm going to run through most of them like the wind. Um, and then television. You know, and then television came along and that then was another, another mechanism for, for, for communicating, another mechanism for, you know, for telling that story. And then there was this. I don't know if you can hear that. Can you hear it? Um, how many of you know, you know what that is and how many of you don't know what that is? Okay, so most of you know what that is. That's, that's obviously the dial-up you know, dial tone to try and log into the internet. And I, I grew up in Lesotho, which meant that there were no ISPs in Lesotho. The closest ISP was in Bloemfontein. Um, so for me, a dial-up was an international call just to try and access the net. Um, and in those days, you had Alta Vista, Anantia search engines where, you know, where every site was literally just a company profile. And then there was this. Um, you know, the birth of the, birth of the, the mobile phone, but in particular, you know, my, one of my first phones was the, the Nokia 2110. Um, I also had, had one of the, one, the earlier ones that was about that big and with Ariel was about that big. And I once forgot it on top of my car and drove off, and actually drove up over it. Um, stopped the car, picked it up, dusted it off, and phoned a friend. And told them what just happened. So I think the question, the question we keep asking is, what is the future of the media? What is the future of content? You know, with, with, with the evolution of digital, with the evolution of mobile, you're constantly hearing, you know, digital is the future, print is dead. Radio is changing, television, you know, so we're constantly focusing on, and, and for me, this is my bigger concern, is that we're constantly focusing on the platform. So we're constantly focusing on the thing, the delivery mechanism, and making it about that. So I mean, I always say that the, the geeks kind of sold us a story and we bought into it. They told us that the internet was important. Not what's in the internet, but the internet is important. So is this the future of the media? You know, the iPad came out, there had been tablets, but in, in 2010 when um, Steve Jobs launched the iPad and it's, it's kind of its current incarnation that has evolved, um, people like Rupert Murdoch said, tablets will save newspapers. You know, he said, I've seen the future. So he started an iPad newspaper in 2011 called The Daily. After about 22 months, they shut it down and they were losing something like up to $30 million a, a month on the, on the thing. Warren Buffett, who, you know, for many of us who are interested in business, interested in investing, interested in building wealth, I mean, he, 
you know, he's the poster child for how to become rich. Um, and he's been buying up newspapers, particularly daily, and particularly in, in communities for the last, I think for the last um, six, seven years, he's just been buying up these newspapers. So you kind of go, okay, everybody's telling us that printers dead, or printers die, and newspapers die. But you have somebody like Warren Buffett who's busy buying up these newspapers. Um, you know, 2012, 2013, he spent $344 million on 28 newspapers. Then you have Jeff, Jeff Bezos. Um, to be honest, you know, everybody looks to Steve Jobs. He's the person that fascinates me the most, just in terms of what he's been able to do with Amazon. And he went and bought Washington Post. And, you know, there's, there's different things happening within Washington Post. So one of the things they did was they offered, I think it's free subscriptions to, to people who are subscribers of a whole bunch of other kind of newspapers and publications around the U.S. Um, the, they've also now put a lot of work, as you'd imagine, within, within the kind of online aspects of their blogs, etc., etc. But he bought the Washington Post and it's still running as a newspaper. I don't know if you know Pitchfork. I mean, Pitchfork, you know, Pitchfork as a site has been around for about 17 years. And it's the site that, for many people, killed, killed kind of music journalism in print form. And yet, they have now launched a, a print publication called Pitchfork Review that comes out every four months. You know, so they've gone the other way. So, you know, a business and a structure that has been really successful from a digital perspective, and they've gone and created a magazine. Jet Magazine in the US, which was in the top three, I think, African-American newspapers, I mean, magazines, and they've gone the other way. They've just gone digital. And Jet Magazine is owned by a company that also owns Ebony Magazine, which is the kind of number one. They're still focusing on print with Ebony. So they're doing a lot of work around the digital, but print is still extremely relevant for them. But the sister title, Jet, They've gone and switched that to a, a purely digital publication. Um, who knows of Netta Porter? I mean, Netta Porter is a basic e-commerce site for fashion. And the male version is Mr. Porter. And, and you know, they sell everything from suits, clothing, etc., etc. For me, what was fascinating about a, a, a site like Mr. Porter's, a couple of years back, they started hiring former journalists. So I think they hired an editor of a former editor of Vogue for Men. And they curate their, their social media in very interesting ways. So, you know, fashion leads, etc., etc., through Instagram, um, Twitter. They really work, you know, they really work their content in an interesting way. So Netta Porter this year at Paris Fashion Week launched a magazine, Porter Magazine. So now you have an e-commerce platform that's gone into the magazine space. And a lot of the discussion is around you know, where do you find that balance? How can they be objective? If they're selling products and, you know, they're selling products and they're competing with other stores and then they have their own publication, you know, will they have, are they now starting to compete with the media that has supported them and they have supported? Or complex media. So, I mean, I don't know if you know Echo Clothing. And the guy who started Echo is the person who started Complex. And Complex has been a magazine, it was a print magazine. But what they've done is they've got a very interesting route. Um, so something like what Uno was talking about, what he's created, you know, kind of between 10 and 5, they've gone and, and picked the lane. So their lane is young male consumers who like sneakers, fashion, music, girls, etc. And they've picked that as their lane. And they've created this network of, now I think it's over 30 different, literally different blocks. And part of their model is, from an advertising perspective, from a client perspective, they'll go, you know, as, a, as, as an advertiser, you talk to Complex, and then they ensure that the spend is spread across the relevant platforms that they have within their network. And one or two, one or two of the guys have come down over the years for various kind of festivals here. And, and there's one where it's one guy. It's one guy who runs a blog, it's around sneakers. Um, recently, I've been a few if you guys follow Sneaker Freaka, the site, um, the guy who started and runs Sneaker Freaka, Sneaker Freaka is within the, the complex media network. He, he, he was down here with, with Adidas. But it literally is just kind of updating of new sneakers, interesting things happening in that space. 
Wink Corp, I don't know if you know of Monaco Magazine. Um, Monaco Magazine is, is, was started and run by a guy called Tyler Brule. And, and you know, for people like me who, you know, who are fascinated about the different things you can do with platform, the different things you can do with content, you know, for me, he, what he's created in that space. Because people know about Monaco, for example, but you have Wink Corp, which is the overall company. And within Wink Corp, they have Wink Creative, which is a branding and design agency. And what I found interesting, I remember a couple of years ago, they had done a, in Monaco they'd done, you know, in Monaco they tend to focus, it's broad, but they'll focus on a particular topic in each issue. And this particular issue was around nation branding. And they used Norway as an example. When Creative worked on the branding and stuff for, for, for the country, Norway. And then in the magazine, they were able to then carry that over. They have stores, like they have London, Paris, New York, I think also Shanghai. And they did an issue where they focused on, particularly in Sweden, kind of industrial design, etc., etc. And they'll get very interesting products made for them that they sell in their shops. So it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a different way of, of, of starting to look at the space because, because it's in such flux. And to be honest, I mean, I keep, you know, I keep, um, berating myself to a certain extent for talking about something like this because every time I do this talk, I'm, I'm about to kind of talk on content. I spend three, four days updating the entire presentation because the landscape is changing so much. So to be honest, last night I was, I was outside and I was, like, I was listening to a podcast because what Monocle does is they also have a 24-hour online radio station which you can then kind of download. And one of the, one of the, the shows that I listen to quite regularly is called um, the, the Stack, which is literally just on print media, a particular magazine. So they talk about the, the different things happening with magazine around the world, right through to, you know, new stockists, kiosks, et cetera, et cetera. And I just find it fascinating that for, for a sector, for an industry that is supposedly dying, um, you know, these people are in it, are going, there's enough information, enough content, enough things going on for us to literally create a show around. And I was listening to one when I was driving here, and I got outside and I was like, well, let me take that side out of the presentation, that doesn't work anymore. And I'm, like I said, I'm going to try and jump through it. And for me, it's about sharing the landscape, and you know, there's, there's, so, there's so many more. But it's sharing the landscape, but I think it's also about how confused we all really are. Um, and, and, and the fact that for me, anybody who says they know what the future of media looks like, or the future of content, or the future of storytelling, has no clue. Because everybody in that space is just trying to figure it out. This is a, 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 a site in Ghana. So Joy FM is a radio station in Ghana, but within their family they have I think they now have about four radio stations. They now have a television network with multiple channels. They have the site, um, which is kind of news, etc., etc. You can then listen to obviously the, the various radio stations on the site. You can watch various videos around that they create. So it's become this. You know, it's become this very holistic experience. Um, I'm a sports fan. I don't know how many of you engage with the Super Sport and the DSTV sites and apps. Um, so, you know, with, with Super Sport in particular, you can watch games, you can stream games like they've got the news, they've got different events they run, etc, etc. So, it's about enriching the experience, but also trying to find the different touch points to be in. YouTube, you know, something like YouTube, and there's a new, well, I mean, she's relatively new, new head of YouTube, who was, I think, a Googler number 16, and she's now moved over you know, fully from Google onto, onto YouTube. And, you know, the thing is that the possibilities that YouTube give with, with channels is, is limitless. So with a friend of mine, we started, although we haven't done anything this year, we're having a conversation, we decided actually, you know what, let's just try this thing out. So we started a web series called The Art of Life. And we had a friend who's a director, editor, producer, etc. and he just would come in with one camera and would sit and would, with two guys talking crap about tech, design, motoring, etc. and would pop up, you know, five, five minute videos. 
We're now in a space where you can do that. We're now in a space where you can also experiment, you can try out different things. And yes, while in South Africa and Africa, we are still lagging behind. For example, in YouTube, I mean, there's the guy who, I can't remember his name now, he does a site called, I think it was the Six Pack Factory. And this guy literally just started, he was, he was overweight, and he started kind of filming his progression. And eventually, I think it was in the top 10, you know, earners of YouTube in this country. And now I've been doing DVDs and consulting, etc., etc. So he's built this entire, you know, off online, offline business just off sharing his experiences. Um, I don't know if you know of iRocking. I, mean, I think in Nigeria there's a lot of thing, interesting things being done with content in that space. Um, so iRocking is, you know, you can go and watch movies. They have radio channels. You have music, etc. But what a lot of guys did was, you know, with the Nollywood movies, there was no central place where you could go and watch the different movies. And if you went to Nigeria, it's how do you access them? You know, DSTV now has a couple of channels where you can see those, but there's a lot of stuff being produced around the continent, but how do you access them? So what he started doing was just literally talking to all the distributors. And the distributors are in essence hawkers. Because if you go to West Africa, I mean, my roots are in Ghana, if you go to West Africa, I buy my music, I buy my, my, my football jerseys, I buy my clothes, I buy everything on the street. Because, because the infrastructure, particularly in terms of shops and shopping centers, etc., etc., is still developing. And I think a lot of us know BuzzFeed, and this BuzzFeed, this Huffington Post. I mean, I just discovered Huffington Post has Huffington Post parents. Um, so they have now kind of unpacked it down to the different niche areas from a content perspective. And, and they're one of the platforms that kind of go, yes, there's, there's opportunity in digital. And then we talk social media. Everybody, and I, I, I like showing slides like this to friends of mine who go, tech is the future, digital is the future. Because I'm like, okay, so which part of this? You know, there's so many platforms, and I, and I guarantee you, you know, if any of you look on there, you'll, there's a couple that you'll find that are not there. And so these are all kind of content delivery mechanisms. So which one do you do? Which one do you go for? The social, I mean, this, this is this kind of social publishing realm, but also traditional publishing in the same way. It's, there's just so much stuff out there. There's so much noise, there's so many platforms, there's, you know, so many different ways of communicating and, and sharing content. And, and that's why for me, kind of, I went through the last whatever minutes and talked a lot just to say, none of us know what's going on. All of us are really just trying to figure it out. And you experiment with different ways of doing it. You know, you have the aggregators, the flipboard, the prismatics, the zites, etc. And they're going, okay, we're not going to mess with the content. What we'll do is we'll take other people's content and package it in a particular way. Maybe that's the way for us to do it. So, so at the heart of it for me is about this idea of creating, curating, and repurposing. And I mean, this is like a social media root of thumb, but I think it applies across the board, particularly when you're dealing with content in this day and age. You know, sharing the same content on different platforms in different in, in ways that fit that platform. Fortunately, people have stopped doing it as much. I used to hate it when people would link, say, Facebook, LinkedIn to Twitter. So you tweet something, and then it's on, you know, it's a Facebook status update, and it's on LinkedIn. But what do you lose when you do that? Context. You lose the story, you lose the headspace, the state of mind. And at the same time, Facebook, as a status update, you have a lot more space. So you have the opportunity to really kind of start to unpack it a bit more. Twitter, you have to be succinct, you have to be clear in your thinking. So it's, it's a different way of communicating. Um, I'd be amiss, I know they told me not to talk about my stuff, but to pay my bills. I mean, I, so I work for Destiny Man magazine. And, and we're five years old now. One of the things that fascinated me when I started with the business was when people said, oh, you guys are a magazine, we go, no, we're a content portal. Because we can't just be a magazine. Um, our readers, consumers are in different places. And a friend of mine said, it's, it's kind of like you have different border posts, and what you're trying to do is ensure that, you know, the people you interact with and the people you engage with have a visa for every single border post. 
So whether it's print magazine, whether it's a website, whether it's social media, um, we even do events, whether it's an event, and a lot of publications are starting to do that. The Guardian in the UK has actually also bought a space now. It's not just running events, but actually creating a space to ensure that they can, you know, they have, it's, it's another platform and another channel of really being able to communicate and engage and put together content. And, and for me, this kind of, to a certain extent, epitomizes this idea of you have to start to look at things differently. The X-Men. Series of between five and eighty films about a ragtag team of mutants sworn to protect a world that hates them just for the simple crime of being different. To be fair, about fifty percent of them are hell-bent on wiping out the human race. Now, we've got two main players here, Professor X and Magneto, two old frenemies. One bald, the other not bald. One with incredible powers of the mind, the other with different incredible powers of the mind. Uh, both wear helmets. Are you picking up the parallels here? Professor X runs a school for the gifted mutant freaks, where he teaches them to hone their abilities. There are literally hundreds of thousands of mutants in this series, so let's break them into categories just for the sake of time. One group, mutants covered in stuff. You've got your metals, your ices, your fires, your various slimes, spikes, and goos. Another group, flyers. You've got your angel archetypes, your people named after birds, about 15 mutants who control the wind or gravity. Let's not forget the disappearies, your time jumpers, your space jumpers, that guy who turned into a puddle. There's also shapeshifters, energy warpers, multiple dudes who are basically just a boulder, guys who are blue. Dozens and dozens of mutant abilities make up this universe. And then of course, there's Wolverine. Make no mistake, this is really just the Wolverine show co-starring the X-Men. We follow Wolverine as he joins the team, defeats a geriatric magnet enthusiast, steals their girlfriends, and rides off on a Harley while everything explodes behind him. His past can be summed up like this. He's a 170-year-old, cage-fighting Civil War soldier, government experiment, Vietnam vet, mutant Canadian samurai with sideburns and an affinity for motorcycles. Named after what's basically a feisty badger. He is the most gratuitously hardcore superhero that has ever existed. He's been shot, stabbed, bitten, impaled, burned, drowned, and disintegrated. Look up badass in the dictionary and Wolverine will be there, performing open heart surgery on him himself asking why you're still using a dictionary. These films are great because they combine themes like teamwork and family with loneliness, abandonment, prejudice, racism, all mixed up with the most astonishing superpowers ever put on film. Well, not always astonishing. You know, you do see quite a few subpar mutants. And subpar? Yeah, like, you know, low-class mutants. What are you saying? Like, you know, those mutants whose powers don't really make sense. Uh, like, like the Cajun guy with the playing cards. Sure, that's Gambit. Yeah, what even is that? That's his power? He makes cards explode and he's got a stick? Well, his mutant ability is to transmit the potential energy of inanimate objects into kinetic energy, rendering it explosive on contact. Or Professor other... X, you know, if he has brain powers, why can't he just make himself walk? Well, he's a powerful telepath, but not necessarily a telekinetic. You see, telekinetics can move physical objects with their minds, whereas telepaths can only read oh, Okay, them. but Sabretooth, what's his thing? He has long nails. Look, I'm just saying, not all mutants are- Are you seriously playing not all mutants with me right now? Forget it. I will forget it. TLDW, Wolverine is immortal and everyone else sucks. So, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's from Mashable, and I think, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you, if not all of you, engage with Mashable in different ways. Uh, you know, so for me, that, that really epitomizes the different things that you can do with, you can do with content. And, and the thing I'm learning is, in my job, for example, as, as an editor, in essence, I'm just the chief content officer. And a large part of my work is to try and figure out you know, when you engage with different pieces of content to try and figure out the best ways to package it, the best ways to communicate it. So, you know, something, this, this kind of experience of standing and speaking, and, you know, I think we all follow different spaces like TED, etc., where, you know, you could get a transcript of this, you could get a podcast of this, you could, you could, uh, you know, get a video of it. When I'm interviewing somebody, it's the same thing. You could film it, you could record it, um, you could write, three, four different articles, all targeting different angles. So, you know, something like Uno, you could talk to him about between 10 and 5, and that's the focus. You could talk to him about his life in the you know, advertising industry prior, and that could be the focus. But you can do that in one conversation, and be able to pull the different bits and pieces of one. And journalists as well, I mean, I, I get to interact with a lot of young people entering the, you know, the journalism space and the media space. And after I asked them why they want to actually do that with themselves, um, I, for me the important thing is you have to be able to learn how to work with a different medium. Uh, because it's not about the medium, so it's, it's about understanding the content and therefore then how you can maneuver it across different platforms. 
And you know, firstly, I've also asked people, what do you need to study to become an editor? And I, my response usually is I have no clue because I did not study journalism. I, I come from a business background, so I majored in economics and marketing and business administration. But I found that I could write. Um, and over time, try to learn how to write better. And when I'm moving to a different type of writing, kind of go, okay, what are, what, are, what are the basics of this particular style that make sense of that? And then brands, and I think, you know, the creative space now, it's, it's really interesting, especially in this country, watching brands trying to figure themselves out. Um, because this country is changing, and this country is so diverse. And at the same time, a lot of brands are realizing that how they've been trying to engage with people is not working anymore. And I think also a lot of advertising agencies, PR, etc., etc., are also realizing that the way they've traditionally done stuff is different. Because, you know, for me, it's about the content, the context, and the relevance. Um, so, with a magazine like Destiny Man, or if I'm writing anything else, my focus is on who am I, you know, who am I engaging with, who's my reader. And I let that be the foundation and the lens through which I engage with any piece of information. So it's no more about kind of my view on what I think is right. It's understanding the people that I'm engaging with. And also understanding that nobody wants to be talked at anymore. And I say that standing here talking at you guys, but yes, nobody wants to be talked at anymore. Um, you know, we will buy things on the basis of a friend's recommendation. Um, there's, a, there's a particular client I have, and I had a meeting with them this week. I have a, I have a kind of business outside of, outside of my day job, uh, dealing with content. But their biggest challenge is they provide an experience. So it's, it's, it's in travel, and that's what they do. They, you, know, you book with them and you go on holiday. What sets them apart is the experience. So I've been on one of their holidays. So whenever I'm talking holidays with people, I'll be like, listen, you have to try that one because this experience was really, really cool. I really enjoyed it. Now they're trying to find a way to communicate with people in general to kind of go, hey, we're here and you really want to take one of our holidays. And so the conversation I've been having with them is, okay, so how do you capture that experience and share it in such a way that other people will want to go on the holiday? Because they can't tell you, it's not about the price, it's not about the, you know, we can hear about facilities, etc., etc., but their unique selling proposition is that experience. And so what we're talking about is kind of how do you use different platforms, how do you use Instagram, for example, to really capture that experience, or to have other people share those experiences and harness, harness the experiences of the people when they go there, and be able to package it in such a way as to share it with, kind of, call it the wider community. So for me, like I said, it, it is this idea of content and then context and relevance. As well as, I think, it's, it's interesting because we, it's about, while we talk about mass media, it's about, we each want to feel special. We don't want to be told we're special anymore. We want to be shown that we're special. We want to be shown that what's being communicated is for us and it's being packaged in such a way that it makes sense for us. So what I did was I included a couple of videos in case you get bored to, to spice it up. But for me, I'm going to show you a couple of videos and, and kind of as I wind down, talk about the ideas of what content should do. Um, and this is something that happened in Canada.
very similar. And I get a lot of, I get a lot of press releases, for example, in my work. Um, 10, 15, 20 a day of people going, we've got a really cool story, we've got a really cool person, we think you should cover it. And particularly when it's stuff that's for the kind of the betterment of man, so, you know, CSI type stuff, you know, somebody's riding a horse somewhere to raise funds for something, they're climbing something, they're, they're doing etc, etc. You know, the person, we hope, is coming from a good place. But what happens then sometimes a corporate will support this person, what they're doing, we go, okay, we'll, you know, we will fund, we'll fund the administrative or operational part, etc, etc. Then they send out, their PR people send out press releases to say, listen, here's George, and George is about to, you know, walk from Cape to Cairo. And walking from Cape to Cairo, he's raising funds for orphans. So, you know, we're putting money into this, so we really want you to talk about the fact that we're putting money into this thing. Mm -hmm. And my response always is, but where's the story in that? The story, for me, the interesting story is the fact that he's doing this Cape to Cairo thing, but also it's about who he's looking to help. For me, that's the story. And once he's done it, you know, what has, for example, the funds he's raised done to change orphans' lives? That's the interesting story. So something like this, uh, that Duracell did, you know, I sit and I look at it, you kind of go, coming from a kind of content producer perspective, Duracell could talk about this, but for me then, the interesting things become human connection. Being able to talk about that human connection. Being able to talk about, perhaps in cities, I mean, you know, I don't know about, I think, I suspect Pretoria is a lot friendlier than than Johannesburg, but you know, we exist parallel to each other and that's what happens in cities all over the world, but we exist kind of parallel to each other. So we're in the same space, but we're not really in the same space. So people sitting at a bus stop, you're sitting next to each other, but there's no connection. So for me, there's a, there's a story there because it makes you feel a particular way and it gives you insight into, you know, us as a species and the human being and our societies and how we're developing, etc, etc. So it's about kind of approaching that content, approaching that information in different ways. So I mean, I found I found this this thing that I really found fascinating, and it spoke to, it said it better than I could ever say, which is kind of different types of content that we create, and it includes you know life is short, dreams come true, it gives us faith to believe in bigger things, uh, reminds us that we matter, tells us a story, etc. These are all feeling things. You know, these are all feeling things and we are, whether we like it or not, we, we are feeling beings. That's the, what we do. And, and what I like about it is, is that, is that, you know, in terms of my work as a content producer, that's what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to, whether it's inspire, inform, evoke an, an emotion, etc., etc. We had a hell of a rumble. First, I had to whip Tarzan behind for claiming the heat, king of the jungle. For this fight, I done wrestled with an alligator, done tussled the whale, and handcuffed lightning throwing thunder in jail. You know I'm bad? I done murdered a rock, hospitalized a brick. I'm so bad, I make medicine sick. So fast, I run through a hurricane, don't get wet. And when foreman sees me, he'll pay his debt. I'll drown a pool of water. I'll kill a dead tree. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. I'm fascinated by brands like Louis Vuitton. 
because the, they, they tell stories in interesting ways. So if you hadn't seen at the beginning of the video the Louis Vuitton, you wouldn't have created that association, I don't think. And for me that's what it's about, it's about that, it's about that association. I mean, I grew up, so on my wall when I was growing up, I had a big post of Muhammad Ali. Um, you know, he's, he was, he's been one of my idols growing up. And I had a father who was into boxing, etc. But also for that era, particularly in the early 70s, you know, early 70s, mid to late 70s, there was a, you know, it was a particular era in, in kind of the world's history. Well, I think every era now, but around that was, you know, the civil rights movement in the US, apartheid was at its height in, in, in Africa, in South Africa. Um, a lot of African countries were just coming out of it, coming into independence. And so for me, people like Muhammad Ali stood out as kind of idols of how you carry yourself as a man and, and your contribution to society because he went to prison for refusing a fight in the Vietnam War and served, I think, three years. Um, so even being, having conviction and having values and living by those convictions. So when I see that video, it evokes an, you know, a, whole, a whole bunch of emotions for me from childhood to date. And, I mean, like I said, Louis Vuitton fascinates me because, for example, what they did, I mean, two years ago is they commissioned nine French writers to write short stories all around the trunk. So you know the traditional Louis Vuitton trunk, and, but they went and gave them archive material. So it was part fact, part fiction. You could write as true as you wanted or as fictional as you wanted. But at the heart of it was a guy called uh, Louis Gaston Vuitton, who was the third generation, kind of, third generation Louis Vuitton. And one of the stories, for example, was him challenging Harry Houdini to break out of that trunk. And th there's a whole story they shot, beautiful pictures of each writer. And then they put out this book of short stories called The Trunk. And that's it, that's it. It's not selling anything, it's not, it's just this beautiful way of engaging with information, engaging with content. And, and for me, from a, I guess from a commercial and a media perspective, right through to a, a, just a kind of a general perspective, we have to take a step back and look at it differently because the structure, the, you know, the model is broken in a lot of industries nowadays. And in some instances, what we're really trying to do is, we're still trying to evolve it. So we're going, okay, media company, it's in newspapers. How do we evolve it? How do we, how do we change it? So, you know, do we reduce newsroom staff and also have a digital thing? But sometimes I think in some instances you actually just need to shake it up and go, actually we need to start from, we need to start from zero and figure out now what we have, what's the best model, but what's the best way of doing, of going about it. So, you know, other things around content, you know, reveals secrets, surprises us, reminds us that we're one of a kind and encourages us to live that way. Um, confirms our assumptions and challenges our assumptions. I love that David beats Goliath because I think we're also in a time when a lot of us are, I don't know about you, but I often feel like David. Um, but I often feel like David knowing that I can actually beat Goliath because everything has been shaken up, because there's just so much transition. You know, somebody like uh, Uno with 10 and 5 or the people who started BuzzFeed, the Huffington Post, etc. The idea that you can create something that can reach that far and become that big and compete on that level is, is less a, a pipe dream. I'm a forensic artist. Worked for the San Jose Police Department from 1995 to 2011. I showed up to a place I'd never been, and there was a guy with a drafting board. We couldn't see them, they couldn't see us. Tell me about your hair. I didn't know what he was doing, but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me. Tell me about your chin. It kind of protrudes a little bit, hmm. especially when I smile. Your jaw. My mom told me I had a big jaw. What would be your most prominent feature? I kind of have a fat, rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. I would say I have a pretty big forehead. 
Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see them. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about uh, a person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin, it was a nice, thin chin. She had nice eyes. They lit up when she spoke. Cute nose. She had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. So here we are. Hmm. This is the sketch that you helped me create. And that's a sketch that somebody described of you. So yeah, that's... She looks closed off and fatter, sadder too. Mm -hmm. The second one looks more open, friendly, and happy. Mm -hmm. I should be more grateful of my natural beauty. It impacts the choices and the friends that we make, the jobs we apply for, how we treat our children. It impacts everything. It couldn't be more critical to your happiness. Do you think you're more beautiful than you say? Yeah. Yeah. We spend a lot of time as women analyzing and trying to fix the things that aren't quite right. And we should spend more time appreciating the things that we do like. Okay, so I'm gonna just give you some actions to do. I just do the first thing that comes to mind. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Oh, my hair. Oh, God. Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> now throw like a girl. Aw. My name is Dakota, and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means run fast as you can. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. Is like a girl a good thing? Actually, I don't know what it really, if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. So when they're in that vulnerable time, between 10 and 12, how do you think it affects them when somebody uses like a girl as an insult? I think it definitely drops their self-confidence and um, really puts them down because during that time, they're already trying to figure themselves out. And when somebody says, you hit like a girl, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because they think they're a strong person. It's kind of like telling them that they're weak and they're not as good as them. And what advice do you have to young girls who are told they run like a girl, kick like a girl, hit like a girl, swing like a girl? Keep doing it because it's working. If somebody else says that running like a girl or kicking like a girl or shooting like a girl is something that you shouldn't be doing, that's their problem. Because if you're still scoring and you're still getting to the ball on time and you're still being first, you're doing it right. It doesn't matter what they say. I mean, yes, I kick like a girl and I swim like a girl and I walk like a girl and I wake up in the morning like a girl because I am a girl. And that is not something that I should be ashamed of. So I'm going to do it anyway. That's what they should do. If I asked you to to run like a girl now, 
would you do it differently? I would run like myself. Would you like a chance to redo it? Yeah. Why can't run like a girl also mean win the race? How do those make you feel? I think there's a, I, I sincerely believe there's an inherent responsibility in, in working with things like, you know, we, we, we get caught up in these words, content, storytelling, etc. But I also believe there's an inherent responsibility in, in that, in, in terms of what, for example, I do, I do on a daily basis. And I, I believe that when we focus on the platform, when we focus on, on the thing that is used, the mechanism that's used to communicate, we lose sight of that which is the important thing is about what you're communicating and how it resonates and if it's making sense and, and what it's doing. Sometimes it's about giving pure pleasure. Uh, sometimes it's about entertainment, sometimes it's about being silly, but also sometimes it's about informing and, and helping guide society and helping guide who we are. So, I mean, you know, there's the saying, you know, it's about the medium, not what it's, what the medium is the message and I sincerely believe it's about the message. And, and I believe that that's how we, we need to start looking at the world. We need to start, you know, interacting with the space. And it may sound utopian, particularly in a time when, when a lot of what's considered media is, is frivolous and surface. And, and, I mean, I'm one of those people, I, I don't particularly care what people are wearing and what they're eating and who they're sleeping with, etc. Um, but that's just because I have a particular perspective and a particular way of looking at content. Um, and, and so this is kind of the end, but that said, I had one video, and, I, and I, I brought this video purely just because I ran into it the other day and I really liked it and I wanted to share it. So. Did you know the average person spends four years of his life looking down at his cell phone? Kind of ironic, ain't it? How these touch screens can make us lose touch. But it's no wonder in a world filled with IMAX, iPads, and iPhones, so many eyes, so many selfies, not enough us's and we see. Technology has made us more selfish and separate than ever. Cause while it claims to connect us, connection has gotten no better. And let me express first, Mr. Zuckerberg, not to be rude, but you should reclassify Facebook to what it is, an anti-social network. Cause while we may have big friend lists, so many of us are friendless all alone. Cause friendships are more broken than the screens on our very phones. We sit at home on our computers, measuring self-worth by numbers of followers and likes. Ignoring those who actually love us, it seems we'd rather write an angry post and talk to someone who might actually hug us. Am I bugging? You tell me, cause I asked a friend the other day, let's meet up face to face. They said, all right, what time you wanna Skype? I responded with OMG, SRS, and then a bunch of SMHs and realized, what about me? Do I not have the patience to have conversation without abbreviation? This is the generation of media overstimulation. Chats have been reduced to snaps. The news is 140 characters. Videos are six seconds at high speed. And you wonder why ADD is on the rise faster than 4G LTE. But get a load of this. Studies show the attention span of the average adult today is one second lower than that of a goldfish. So if you're one of the few people or aquatic animals that have yet to click off or close this video, congratulations. Let me finish by saying you do have a choice, yes. But this one, my friends, we cannot autocorrect. We must do it ourselves. Take control or be controlled, make a decision. Me, no longer do I want to spoil a precious moment by recording it with a phone. I'm just going to keep them. I don't want to take a picture of all my meals anymore. I'm just going to eat them. I don't want the new app, the new software, or the new update. And if I want to post an old photo, who says I have to wait until Thursday? I'm so tired of performing in the pageantry of vanity and conforming to this accepted form of digital insanity. Call me crazy, but 
I imagine a world where we smile when we have low batteries Cause that'll mean we'll be one bar closer to humanity The multiple platforms are great. <coughs> like I'm a big believer in, in, in the things that you can do with these multiple platforms. I think it's really just about being conscious of what we're doing and, and being able to pull the best out of it. Um, and also, but also recognizing the risks, the risks attached with it. And, and so for me, the idea of content, the idea of storytelling is like, is very much the idea of living the life that we're living on a daily basis. And just kind of, like I said, being conscious of it and using them to the best of their ability and remembering that the, there's, there's, more to, there's more to life and there's more to all of these things. So, yes, thank you very much. I hope that was of some use. <laughs>